So it is time to get started. Uh, so without further ado, I will introduce, I think he needs no introduction, but I will introduce uh, Dr. Neil Kravitz, who is our Pearls editor uh, at JCO. And that's particularly relevant today because this article, uh, excuse me, this lecture is basically um, an hour full of pearls, uh, not necessarily from the pearl section, but from JCO uh, in general in the last few years. And uh, I, think, I think it'll be a valuable look into what you can get out of JCO in just a couple of years time. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Dr. Kravitz. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let me just share my screen and we'll get started. Yep, you're good. Okay, now I can't see the chat box on my screen. Is that okay? Can you just let me know if there's questions that come around? Okay, so let's get started with uh, my favorite uh, clinical pearls over the last five years. This is a fun presentation. Now, uh, traditionally when I uh, give presentations, I, I have a few opportunities to practice them with smaller groups. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, not the case with this presentation. So this will be the first time giving it. And these are um, really not my clinical pearls. I, I, I will share a few of them just because of the length of time, but they're really uh, to credit the great um, contributors to the JCO. And I really tried to highlight um, all the great orthodontists out there who have written and contributed to the pearls section. And these are my favorite clinical pearls from, from other orthodontists. My role at the JCO, uh, I'm an associate editor uh, for the Clinical Pearls. Um, hopefully you can sense from all my posts how much I truly love this journal. Um, it, it is uh, a true passion of mine to read and write for the, the JCO. And uh, as, as I've said many times, it is very much an action-packed clinical journal. It, you can almost pick up any uh, new edition and apply what you have read uh, immediately into your clinical practice. Um, so I, I get very excited when I get the journal in my hands. And if you are a subscriber, thank you very much. But if you subscribe only to the digital version, I can't stress enough how important it is to also get the physical version too, because there's something very important about that journal being mailed to you and sitting on your desk uh, so you can read it right away. Uh, the definition of a pearl for me is very much an easy to apply clinical technique. Um, I get so many wonderful pearls that are submitted uh, to Dr. Keim, who is the, the, the wonderful head editor to the, um, to the JCO, um, and he passes those along uh, for me to review. Uh, and they're all wonderful, but really the key that I'm looking for is something that is very easy to apply and something that people can use right away. They'll read that pearl and say, that, why didn't I think of that uh, and apply that right away? And it doesn't have to be necessarily unique. I, I don't think anybody is the true originator uh, of a pearl. These things date back um, you know, 50, 60 years plus. I'm sure you could always find uh, the, you know, an earlier version of that technique. But... Um, Really the essence of pearling up a pearl is to share and uh, sharing and contributing to our profession and giving back is a big mission for me. As I always say, we're colleagues, not competitors. And the idea of a clinical pearl is that you have this idea and you cannot wait for that idea to be shared and for other orthodontists to use them. Uh, for this presentation, I'll be focusing really on the last five years. So I, uh, I went through uh, the JCO, I, I really flipped through all the pearls that I really love, and I want to highlight them and, and also mention uh, the great authors who contributed. And uh, the goal for today is I, I want you to be able to take home a few techniques. So I, I hope you're enjoying the AAO meeting. They've done a wonderful job. And uh, I hope while you're at lunch, you can pick up a few fun clinical pearls. Um, and then ultimately, um, your support for the JCO means the world. Uh, what we really want from you, uh, if you've enjoyed 
uh, my presentations, if you've enjoyed um, the clinical pearls that I've shared online on social media groups, the greatest gift, the greatest thank you you could possibly give would be to subscribe for the JCO. Uh, it would mean so much to me and all the wonderful editors and employees who have worked so hard to keep this journal going uh, for almost 60 years now. Okay, uh, many of you uh, know Dr. Kine. He is a legendary teacher. He is just also one of the nicest people uh, you will ever meet. And uh, he had a wonderful uh, webinar yesterday about publishing for the JCO. So I know many of you have these great ideas. If, if you know me, I know Sergio is listening right now. Uh, my great friend, I'm always messaging him, telling him to publish his cases. Um, but Dr. Kahn talked about how to get published in the JCO. And if you have a great idea and you're nervous about writing or uh, you maybe don't have enough time to write, he will help uh, write for you and write with you. So I really encourage uh, you to watch that wonderful webinar by Dr. Kahn, who's a great storyteller. And, uh, and if you have a wonderful idea, we want to hear from you and we want to get that idea published. If you see a yellow box, um, this is a pretty traditional for all my presentations. This is a, um, a clue to the, um, to the audience member that I really want you to, to, to pique your interest. I think this is an important photograph or an important slide. Again, your support for the JCO means so much. Uh, most people know that I have two offices in Northern Virginia. Uh, my first office is a, a little over 15 years old in South Riding, Virginia. And my uh, second office in Ashburn is about eight years old. And we're about 30 minutes outside of Washington, DC. This is my wife, Margaret, uh, at the bottom left. This was my angle um, induction uh, ceremony, which was a very special day for me. And my son, Jack, and, and his brother, James, they're now almost seven and um, almost five. And then baby Edith, who will be turning two in the next few months as well. I'd also like to give a lot of credit to the Facebook group, Orthodontic Pearls, which really has a nice hand and glove fit with what I do for the JCO. So I always love looking at this site and seeing all the wonderful pearls and convincing all the people who are contributing their pearls to write them for the JCO. Uh, but if you are not a member of Orthodontic Pearls, I encourage you to be. Uh, there's also a, a number of great groups out there. Um, you know, um, um, Orthodontic Mastery Group with Mo and Mark. Um, a forum of clinical orthodontics with Vishnu Raj, obviously one of the world's great clinicians. Uh, but this is a wonderful uh, Facebook group, Orthodontic Pearls, that, that, that works very well with what I get to do as the editor uh, for, the, um, uh, for the Pearls section. But if you go onto our JCO page, you'll see some wonderful webinars that are available to you if you subscribe. And uh, I, re I just gave a, uh, a lecture on uh, class two mechanics with the Mara and the Herbst appliance. Uh, this is a little bit of an extended version of that presentation. But there's some incredible webinars that, that are accessible. Tom Pitts uh, teaching bracket positioning in, in his smile arc design. I cannot stress this enough. That article is always one of the most downloaded articles every year. Uh, Lou, I see you online right now. Lou Schumer is one of the great orthodontists and he makes understanding OSA and OSA appliances very easy. Lou is one of the great teachers of, uh, of our generation and, and he always talks about a very important uh, topic of sleep apnea. So wonderful webinars that are available. Stu Frost and Gummy Smile. Stu gave a wonderful lecture yesterday for the AAO. Uh, him and Trevor are just at a different level uh, and it goes on and on and on. These webinars are unbelievable and you have free access to it with a subscription. So I highly encourage you uh, to watch that. Now, I have a unique way of presenting. Um, I usually have slides that are almost entirely um, photo-based, and I really want to make it a, a visual progression step-by-step. Step. But this is going to be a little different. I want to highlight the article um, and not so much the image. And if I have um, my own application of that pearl, I'll show that on a different slide. So this is the format of today's presentation. I'll show the article on the left. I'll highlight the figures from that article, and then I'll highlight a few key steps from that pearl. So we'll talk about the pearl, and we'll try to break down that pearl. And if there's a, a nice uh, little um, pearl within the pearl, as I always like to do, I'll, um, I'll, I'll put a little quote box to highlight that as well. All right, so let's start with 
the greatest pearl uh, <laughs> of the last five years and, and maybe greater, uh, and really the essence of a pearl, which is to take something so simple and just tweak it a little bit. And, 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 and really uh, everybody will ooh and ah. And this comes from uh, my great friend, Dr. Nick Azusas, and, and Jonathan um, uh, is just truly one of the great teachers, but also one of the great writers. Uh, I, I've described him, uh, you know, the way you read like Lyle Johnston, I read like um, J Jonathan's articles. They're, they're written so well and they're unique with their writing. And he has such a, a way of expressing himself. Um, hopefully you all heard Maz's amazing presentation yesterday and then Jonathan's uh, amazing presentation today. Uh, but this is my favorite pearl probably ever. And this is his beauty queen sash attachment. One of the least predictable movements is extrusion and extrusion and rotation of the lateral incisor. Uh, the aligner simply does not track well. Many times we have to transition our Invisalign patients into one or two months of fixed appliances at the end of treatment just to move that lateral. And that lateral incisor is a very individual individualistic tooth of people there's a lot of character to that tooth and particularly women they want that lateral longer they want that lateral labial forward and and they're very precise with the position of that tooth and that tooth does like to slip and it does like to relapse quickly so moving it predictably with invisalign is very challenging so it's not enough to place a horizontal attachment jonathan likes to do a sash attachment particularly if you need rotational correction and he will do a 45 degree bevel he likes it gingerly beveled and he likes to put that attachment toward the incisal one third of the tooth where the aligner material is thicker so we're looking for a four millimeter long attachment they'll traditionally only give you a three millimeter long attachment with 1.5 millimeter thickness if you go into that article so again it's at the junction of the incisal third okay so if you look at the article, Jonathan gives you nice written instructions. You can simply copy and paste them. I can't tell you how many times I just write a Nicosesis sash attachment and Invisalign seems to know what to do. But if you're using your own in-office aligners, um, I encourage you um, not just use a horizontal bevel attachment, but to do a sash attachment if you need a little bit of rotational correction. Again, four millimeters by 1.5 by 1.25. Uh, at a 45 degree angle at the incisal one third. Now, a nice little pearl for this is you don't just need to do this uh, for your uh, rotated laterals that you're trying to extrude. What about rotated premolars? So this is a wonderful article that I wrote with Jonathan and Maz and my good friend, Sean Miller. And we're talking about deep bite correction. And what we want to do for our deep bites is we want to create that nice reverse curve of speed where we extrude our posterior teeth and intrude our anterior teeth. But we want to extrude those premolars to open the bite. That's very classic. But, but what if that premolar is also rotated? Well, the, the order of operations with Invisalign will, will not let you kind of do both at the same time. So what we want to do is we want to take our horizontal beveled attachment and make a sash out of it. This lets us extrude that lower right five, but also give us some rotational correction. So you can use your sash for your upper twos, but don't be afraid to use them for your lower fours and your lower fives if you also want to rotate those teeth as well. So I want to stay on the topic of Invisalign with an incredibly creative pearl. I think when this pearl uh, um, came on my desk, I screamed. It was so genius. It's so simple, but so beautiful. Uh, this is a pearl uh, by Dr. Thiessen on how to create uh, lingual tongue spurs. Now, what the author is doing is they are stacking horizontal attachments. Look, there's not just one row, but there's actually two rows of stacked attachments uh, on the aligner. Very, very, very important. Okay. This is also a nice little trick if you're creating lingual turbos for overbite correction and the patient's so retrognathic that they're not touching those turbos, you can extend the turbos by stacking. But here we are stacking horizontal attachments. Now, these are un filled attachments. We're not going to fill these with composite, but rather we're going to take a burr and we are just going to sharpen, really open up these wells and create spikes for tongue thrust. Invisalign is wonderful uh, for open bite patients. We were trying to get posterior impaction and anterior open bite closure. And now it's even better because you can create this, this, uh, this habit breaking addition 
to it. Now you could also probably um, maybe incorporate elastic button cutouts and simply bond uh, tongue tamers. That probably could also work. But I thought this was a real genius idea of creating uh, a habit breaker within the plastic by using unfilled um, wells. These are stacked attachments and they're modified with a burr. Fantastic. Now, this reminded me of a wonderful pearl by Scott Frey. Scott is one of the great Invisalign teachers. Uh, everybody knows Scott. He's got, also got a wonderful Facebook group, OrthoCosmos, that I encourage you to join. Um, but Scott uses attachments um, unfilled on the occlusal uh, as a way of using a functional turbo to help you with your class two correction. So here he is running class two elastics with an unfilled um, occlusal uh, um, ter um, attachment and that material is being used as almost like a twin block appliance to help correct that class to uh, quicker. So highly encourage you uh, to look at Scott's articles. It's in the resin turbo article in the JCO. Now going, staying with the Invisalign theme, one of my favorite um, Curls is from Chris Seda. Chris is not only one of the great orthodontists, uh, but he's also one of the great inventors. Uh, and we'll highlight one of his great inventions in a second. And this is a subtle pearl. And you have to look very closely at the images to understand. This pearl is on virtually eliminating undercuts with Invisalign. So if you have a patient who has a uh, bridge and a large and a pontic, or in this particular patient has a um, if you look closely, it has an implant here. What happens is you get these undercuts um, and the tray uh, will go underneath the undercuts, of course. And when the patient tries to put on the aligner, the tray ends up folding, which is very frustrating. And the aligner doesn't fit. It lifts off. The patient comes in for emergency appointments. Um, it becomes a whole ordeal. And it's a very easy fix. Uh, if you have a patient with crowns or implants or pontics, uh, you eliminate the undercut by asking Invisalign on your ClinCheck to create simulated gingiva that is higher. You want to shorten that clinical crown. And here we are taking a line so you can see it. It's subtle, but he's just lifting up that gingiva just a little bit to prevent uh, that undercut in the aligner material. And the key here that I want you to get is that he's doing this both on the buckle and the lingual. Don't forget, most people forget to do it on both sides. Do it on the buckle and the lingual. Now, a nice, uh, so here, here we are in our office. You can see the lower right uh, six is a crown, and you can see those strong undercuts um, in that yellow circle. And the problem is the patient tries to put it in, and they always fold the tray like this. The aligner folds in and never fits. So, by creating a simulated gingiva, it avoids this happening. Just a, a subtle, simple pearl that people quickly forget, but if you add it to your armamentarium, it really helps you out on those complicated cases. Because when I see a patient with a lot of restorative work, I, I am immediately thinking about using clear aligners. Now, to kind of use this pearl a little differently, sometimes you will do like Invisalign 5, or you'll have software that will not let you put on elastic button cutouts. Uh, so what you can do if the software does not allow you to do it, you can override the software by just simulating the gingiva into an elastic button cutout. So here I want to run class three elastics to maintain my overjet. The software will not let me do it. Uh, so I said, okay, if you're not going to let me put in the elastic button cutout, I am simply going to add gingiva. I'm going to request to add gingiva and create my own elastic button cutout. So it's a nice little way to override the software uh, if if you're not allowed to use the buttons that you want to use. Here we are again, I'm adding gingiva so I can place the attachment type that I want. So frequently I need more room. Maybe you needed a buckle tube and they're not giving you enough room. Just make the gingiva bigger in that area. And that's a way to override the software. But this brings us to a nice secondary pearl. I always like to have a pearl within a pearl. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Seta also has this wonderful pearl, an invention that he created where it is a precision button. This was also featured in the JCO. And uh, I was very proud that this was featured in the JCO because this was a finalist for the Orthodontic Innovator Award uh, as part of the CTEC committee that I get to sit on. So we were all very proud uh, of, of Dr. Seta for a real orthodontic invention. Uh, we use this exclusively in our office. So if you are 
running class two elastics. And remember, if you're doing deep bite correction, usually class two elastics help you and you want that molar extrusion. So putting on a button on the lower six helps with that molar extrusion. Um, I really encourage you to use these precision buttons. I believe they're now sold by Dynaflex. In the anterior region, I like to use a hook. But they do make clear plastic buttons as well if you want to use those. Now, one of my favorite uh, lines by Dr. Tim Wheeler, uh, which he wrote almost 15 years ago, was Invisalign is not limited to plastic aligners alone. And what he meant by that is there's nothing wrong if you have to use hybrid mechanics. Uh, and though the term hybrid mechanics probably wasn't out by then, uh, I really credit Dr. Wheeler, the great orthodontist from Florida, uh, for really introducing the idea that uh, plastic treatment doesn't mean just plastic alone. It's not a failure to have to use a combination of plastic and metal appliances. So here's a great article from Dr. Pallone where we're using hybrid mechanics for a rotated um, upper right, uh, upper left uh, second molar. So we will commonly have teeth that come in and crossbite, or maybe we want just a little bit of correction. Maybe we had to take the braces off early and we're not happy with our second molars. Uh, this is a wonderful way where you can use hybrid mechanics. So here the aligner is actually ending over the occlusal of the upper, um, the upper six, and you have segmental appliances being used to kick that molar out of crossbite and back into the arch. So hybrid Invisalign means using both plastic and fixed appliances, and you're going to want to cover part of the tooth of the last tooth that you do have a, um, a tube on. And it's wonderful. Uh, in my office, I use hybrid mechanics when I have a deep bite class two patient with spacing. I'll say that again. I love upper Invisalign, lower braces when I have a class two deep bite with spacing. When I see a deep bite patient with spacing on the lower arch, of course, that is a challenging case. That's almost like a surgical case crying at you. And what I like to do in my office is upper Invisalign, lower fixed appliances. I'll run reverse curve of speed arch wires and heavy class two elastics. Uh, yesterday, here we are partially covering that molar. Now, uh, this is a, a, a picture from my office where I'm using a hybrid uh, technique where I am simply uh, cutting the aligner and I'm using the hybrid technique to extrude that rotated uh, premolar. But yesterday I talked about my one of my favorite ways to use hybrid mechanics, which is not just um, braces, but hybrid with appliances. So here we have a class two patient, very hypertonic muscle tone. And what I'm doing is I'm using a Mara appliance uh, with upper five to five Invisalign. I talked about this a lot yesterday. If you're going to do this technique where you run the Mara and simultaneously have Invisalign in the mouth or Invisalign teen in the mouth, there's a couple of rules that I want you to follow. I like to use um, upper Invisalign teen five to five. Obviously, you can't go on the sixes because the sixes will be part of the Mara appliance. And you can't have rests on your upper component because you need your upper Invisalign to fit. People always ask me, why don't we do lower Invisalign? Well, remember, you have a lower holding arch on the bottom. And if you move that holding arch away from the teeth to fit the aligners, uh, what happens is the appliance likes to tip downward mesially. So I don't like to run lower Invisalign Why I have a Mara appliance in. So if I'm using a hybrid technique, it's a Mara appliance with upper five to five Invisalign. And the most important pearl that I want you to get from this is when you remove the Mara, and you're ready to scan for upper and lower Invisalign, you want to retain the patient in Essex retainers because if you don't, by the time you deliver those aligners six weeks later, uh, the teeth will settle and they won't fit into your new aligners. Uh, one of the great pearls comes from a, a local orthodontist uh, near me uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, Amanda Gallagher-Wetzel. Amanda has got a number of wonderful offices uh, throughout the state of Maryland. And this is a simple uh, pearl, but it is so effective. And what she's doing with this pearl, it's called a maxillary expansion bite plate. She takes a Haas expander and really adds an anterior bite plate to it. So really a split anterior bite plate. Uh, you know, there's so many ways to take an expander and to do a split appliance, right? Split cribs uh, is, a, is, a, is one that comes to mind. But here we're doing a split anterior bite plate. And her theory was, you know, listen, a lot of times when you have very narrow transverse discrepancies, you have very deep retronathic bites. And um, this is a way of simultaneously fixing the transverse 
and the vertical. In my office, I don't place a lot of brackets during the first phase, but if you do, this method lets you get on those lower teeth early without risk of brackets being broken. So what it is is a Haas expander, and there is acrylic in the anterior. Look at that clear acrylic. She's extending that acrylic anteriorly to give you a bite plate to correct a deep bite as well as a transverse discrepancy. Again, allows you to place those lower braces earlier. So here is a version in my office. Uh, we're using just regular acrylic, so it's a little bit easier to visualize here. And it's a Haas expander, and we're extending that expander anteriorly uh, to help correct a deep impinging bite simultaneously. I highly encourage you to try this. Now, you can do this with a Hyrax too. You don't need to do it with um, uh, um, a Haas. They can just do it off the frame and just do a split um, anterior. I encourage you to put rests on the upper Ds uh, because you really need that type of support. But one of my all time favorite pearls from Dr. Wetzel um, is a split uh, expander with an anterior bite plate for both transverse and vertical correction simultaneously. Okay, keeping with phase one, I'd like to go talk about my good friend Chris Teeters. Uh, Chris has a, a wonderful practice, uh, and Chris uh, has written many times for the JCO, and here he is talking about his uh, fantastic uh, Halterman Hyrax appliance. Here we have a phase one patient who has a constricted upper jaw, but also has impacted second molars. Now, traditionally, what we would have done is play, we put in um, upper four, uh, uh, upper, uh, upper D, upper E, upper six brackets and try to kick the molar back uh, before we do the expander, segmental braces before we do the expander. But what Chris is doing is taking a very traditional appliance, a very old fashioned appliance, a Halterman appliance, a very much a pediatric appliance and putting it on an expander with bands on the upper E's in giving you both transverse correction and molar kickout. Okay, now the challenge of this, of course, is how to get that band on those upper D's. And you could always trim the distal of the band short if you need to. Uh, I've even seen some people put bands on the upper D's and rests on the upper E's. That works well. I noticed that uh, Dr. Teeters added a separator between the upper E's and the upper sixes. Again, just brilliant work. Um, Dr. Teeters has lectured for the AO many times on his many clinical pearls, um, and he's a frequent contributor. This is uh, my version of the Teeters Halterman Hyrax. Uh, again, I'm banding the upper E's. I have rests on the upper uh, D's, and we are kicking back that upper right six while we expand. And here's the case uh, after completion, we have significant expansion and the upper right six molar holds very well. You can simply section out the appliance and use uh, the um, upper ease as a TPA to preserve that space until the premolar erupts a little bit further down the route. So wonderful technique, the Teeters Halterman Hyrax expander, wonderful for narrow arches with ectopic first molars. Continuing with the phase one theme, this is a great article from Jeff Lee, really highlighting what I used to call the Dave Musich technique, um, who is a wonderful uh, orthodontist on the East Coast. But here we have um, a, um, a Hyrax appliance um, on a class three patient. And instead of using a protraction face mask, what Jeff is doing is using a lower Essex with lower buttons uh, on the lower twos, and we're running class three elastics from the upper Hyrax appliance to the lower arch uh, for phase one class three correction. And we're doing it in the absence of a protraction face mask. So certainly a protraction face mask would be much more efficient, um, but the, uh, this may be a tandem appliance would be much more efficient, but this is just a, a, a way of correcting a more mild version. Now I put in parentheses buttons on the lower C's. I prefer to put the buttons on the C's, not the twos. Um, and the purpose of the Essex retainer uh, is if you don't use an Essex retainer, the teeth will start to extrude, which is certainly something you do not want. Uh, the deciduous teeth would extrude, they would distalize. Uh, so you want that Essex retainer on top of it. And, and this is a very easy technique to do. The only emergency you probably ever have is to replace those Essex uh, as the kids kind of grind through them. 
All right, so here we are in my office using this technique. I'm using this on the lower C's. I have the Essex. The Essex helps uh, open the bite. This patient had a pretty severe class three when we started. Um, and here we are uh, jumping that bite very easily and then um, running those class three elastics. Now, I will tell you, this is a unique case. This patient had a very severely ectopic upper left three. And remember, uh, those canines are commonly ectopic in women and they're commonly ectopic on the left side. So you can see I extracted the upper left C and the upper left D. So my Haas has rests on the upper E's. Okay, you can see this because I'm trying to help correct this ectopic tooth. Now I have theories, here's that ectopic canine right there. I have theories that a protraction face mask is really problematic when you have ectopic canines. These are my pearl within a pearl that I'm trying to teach here. So I, I have theories that a lot of times these patients who are deficient in the maxilla have ectopic and impacted canines. And we run a protraction face mask. And if we're not advancing the anterior teeth, you definitely want to advance those teeth. But if you're not advancing those anterior teeth, you actually are moving the dentition into that canine space and further impacting the canine. So another way of saying this, the same way a cervical headgear or a Herbst appliance creates room for canines by adding arch length, I think sometimes a protraction face mask can reduce arch length um, if you're not maintaining that canine space and you can actually further impact the canine. So in our office, I prefer not to do protraction face masks until the canine descends down the lateral root. And in this particular case, the patient just presented yesterday to start treatment. Look at that upper left three. It has successfully erupted. We did a small open exposure procedure. And here we maintain the class three correction. Uh, she's still uh, a little class three on that right side, but we have that upper left three safely in the mouth. And I, I worry if I had done something stronger with the protraction face mask, would I have worsened that? So uh, try... Um, uh, Amanda's technique for deep bite, narrow patients try. Uh, Dr. Teeter's technique, if you have a narrow bite and ectopic upper canines, uh, upper molars, and try Jeff's technique if you have a class three patient, a mild class three, um, and you are going to, uh, to want to correct that, particularly if you have ectopic upper canines. Uh, a great pearl, uh, keeping along with phase one pearls, is a modified bite plate expander. So uh, bite plate expanders or bonded expanders uh, are wonderful appliances. They're not used as much as they should be used, but they're wonderful, particularly for nervous children or children with unique um, uh, uh, molar anatomy or short clinical crowns um, or just very sensitive children where banding is just very challenging. They're wonderful appliances and the disadvantage of them is just the cleanup afterwards. This is a wonderful um, a wonderful pearl that kind of addresses that problem. Here we are using a protraction face mask. You can see the protraction arms. And a lot of times we like bonded expanders to open up the bite while we do those protraction face masks. Uh, but this is a banded RPE, bands on the upper E's, and it has a hinged bite plate on top of it. So what is glued in is the band. The bands are. The, uh, the acrylic pads are not glued in. They're simply connected by a hinge on top. And when the orthodontist wants to remove that hinge, uh, he or she simply sections it out with a burr. So here we are sectioning out those acrylic pads that rest on top of the teeth. This is essentially a clean, bonded, uh, you know, quote unquote, RPE. Uh, so here the doctor is, they've jumped the bite, they're now ready to remove the acrylic pads, which were never bonded. They were just simply on top of the teeth, resting on top of the teeth. Uh, and you have this nice um, um, traditional hyrax in the mouth. So here's a patient who came to my office last week um, using a bonded expander. I chose this appliance because the patient has a high angle FMA, is about uh, 35 or more degrees. The patient is by max and severely crowded. I did not want to open the bite anymore. The patient will have extractions at the end of phase one uh, prior to doing phase two. So phase one was to correct the crossbite and maintain the vertical. 
in the retention phase between phase one and phase two, I'm going to extract four bicuspids, uh, but I wanted to maintain that vertical dimension. But the problem, if you look closely, is look at the mess. No matter how hard I tried to maintain the hygiene, when I remove the appliance, you can see all the inflammation and the gingiva and, and all the cement that's still around the margins of the teeth. So this pearl that was just presented before uh, really addresses the problem that I have right now. A pearl that you frequently see me write about uh, comes from Jane. Uh, Jane wrote a wonderful article on how to correct a pseudo class three or a pseudo um, uh, crossbite. And a pseudo class three means you don't have a true class three occlusion, but as the upper incisors erupt and you have an edge on bite, sometimes the child will shift forward causing the upper incisor to tip inward lingually. And now you have a traumatic occlusion that lower incisor really can't support uh, any occlusal force. And now you have attachment loss. Uh, so you, you can always put on a two by four, uh, but in the absence of appliances, what this doctor is doing is taking uh, unfilled resin. I stress that enough, unfilled resin. And this is, looks like a fan lock right here. And you're creating what we call a functional turbo. Uh, functional turbo is a term, um, my good friend, Brian Anderson, coined and I, I just love it so much. We're really creating a turbo to open the bite, but there's a bevel to it to correct the bite as well. So here we are in our office uh, with a patient with a pseudo class three. We're getting some attachment loss in the lower ones. And we just simply use some triad gel to open the bite. I put a slight bevel on that triad gel. And here we are jumping the bite uh, within one visit and in three months those teeth uh, erupt nicely and there's no need for appliances. I actually do this work completely for free. We call this phase 0 0.5 and this is a practice builder in our office. And what we're doing here is simply adding the triad gel. Now triad gel uh, is no longer available. Hopefully Reliance and Paul Gange, I know Dr. Cope, one of my great friends and great orthodontists uh, are coming up with a solution to this and, and an equivalent equivalents to this. Um, but uh, right now, try it's on the market. If you don't want to use tri gel, I would encourage you to use Banlock. You don't want to use uh, Transbond LR. You don't want to use your the same composite that you use for brackets. You have quartz in those materials and the quartz in that composite for, for brackets is, is there to prevent bracket flotation. You really want an unfilled resin. Now, now triad gel was great because it was just methacrylate, but Banlock is also very, very good. Um, I would use one or the other. I would not use any type of restorative composite because you'll start to get wear on the opposing teeth. And you're simply creating a bevel and that bevel, uh, here's that triad gel, and uh, that bevel is helping you jump that bite. Now, there's another uh, wonderful pearl that came out recently by Schmidt, which is a modification of Jane's pearl, which is simply a removable version. The great orthodontist from Chicago, Derek Bach, likes this technique a lot too. It's a removable bite plate with an inclined plane. And, um, and this addresses any of the concern you might have of triad gel uh, not being FDA approved for the mouth. So here we are using a removable appliance and you can use any type of composite you want to create that inclined plane. So just a, a question on that last, on the turbo bite. Yeah. While we're, while we're on it, uh, from, from the audience. Uh, <clears throat> someone who tried the turbo bite but got mobility in the lower 3141, how do you avoid that? Yeah, so if you see what I'm doing here on my patient, I, I have the turbo material on more than one tooth, right? So you want to put the turbo material uh, on at least two incisors to jump that bite. Um, you know, the, so, so, you know, I, I don't know that specific case, but in general, what I would, would suggest is to, to splint multiple teeth together and you want to create enough of a bite. I mean, it should fix immediately. Um, that patient should be, um, and, and the occasional patient won't be the right candidate for it. Uh, and, and that's fair enough. But, um, but, but what I'm doing, if you look at this patient is I'm actually splinting multiple teeth at the same time. Um, to immediately uh, reduce the trauma on those lower incisors. Uh, and the key is the bevel. The, the turbo really needs to be long enough. If you look at this image here, look how long I made that bevel in image number C. You really need to extend it back far enough to create that inclined plane, that guiding inclined plane to kick that bite forward. Um, so to answer your question, you need to make it uh, wide enough and you need to make it uh, extend further back enough to be able to jump that bite successfully. And um, maybe a little bit of modification may have helped. And, and, and for some patients, you just need to put on brackets and that's okay. 
Any other questions on the turbos? Uh, nope, doesn't look like it. Okay. All right, so a, a great pearl uh, by uh, Cameron Walker and, and Dr. Roy King. Uh, Cameron and I went to school together, and, 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 and Dr. King is one of the great clinicians of the world. I, I, I hope everybody knows the name Roy King. He is so humble and so wonderful, and I just, every time he posts, I, I just am blown away at the quality of his work. Um, I, just, I just think he's just remarkable. And this is a technique um, called the hemophilic technique or the atraumatic extraction technique. And here we are placing elastic bands, you can also use separators, over baby teeth to help them exfoliate. Now this is not intended to be used for baby teeth that don't have succedaneous teeth uh, coming in, or it's not used for ankylosed teeth, though it probably could, could work. This is to be used for baby teeth that are stuck in the gums and the child is too nervous to let you wiggle them out and the parent refuses to go to the pediatric dentist to get those teeth out. So here we are helping to encourage gingerly retained baby teeth to fall out of the mouth. And all they're doing is taking an elastic band and putting it around the cervical margin of the teeth. Now, this is where it has to separate from the hemophilic extraction technique. In the 1930s, taking out teeth in uh, hemophilic patients was incredibly uh, morbid. There was high morbidity, um, very challenging to stop the bleeding, fatalities did occur. So there was the invention, and it actually may have actually come out of the University of Illinois, Chicago, out of Rush Hospital, a, um, an oral surgeon uh, named Walter William Dallish, who was actually one of the first dentists to diagnose um, the radioluminescent paint disorder in the radium girls. There was a recent movie on this technique on um, uh, the female factory workers who would lick the radium um, paint in the watch factories. Um, but but what well, what they use, they use an elastic band over these patients with uh, hemophilic disorders and any type of blood disorders. And as the elastic band slid down the root of a permanent tooth, the tooth could be extracted atraumatically. And it, since it's been used for patients with bisphosphonates, you'll see vets use it to extract elephant tusks so they don't have to sedate animals. But we're using it in this technique just to remove um, baby teeth uh, on a nervous child. And here's a nice image that I did, I created it on a, um, on a model for you, or we're using it to extract the um, upper right D or the upper left E. And here we are in my office, uh, placing this elastic band on a tooth, you can see, and then the moment the, 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 tooth, the tooth falls out within a day or two, uh, and you'll see the permanent tooth quickly erupt into place. There's no concern that that elastic band would slip over the permanent tooth under the gums. Uh, it's just impossible. That tooth has not even formed its gingival sulcus yet. Actually, what happens is the baby tooth and the elastic band simply exfoliate together. Here we have a more challenging technique. You can use this judiciously. Here's a patient with incomplete resorption of its mesial root, and we're putting an elastic band on the tooth, and the baby tooth falls out within a week. Uh, a wonderful uh, article, uh, also by Dr. King, but also Dr. Rhodes. Stephanie's one of the great uh, orthodontists on the East Coast, as well as Dr. Nista, a great clinician on the East Coast, I believe is in Delaware. Uh, this is closing relapsed spaces with a taunt elastic thread. So here we are bonding an elastic thread uh, tightly to help close a relaxed elastic diastema aesthetically. This is wonderful for a patient who's non-compliant, who would refuse to wear uh, clear aligners with minor tooth movement. Um, you know, this is a nice alternative to a technique that we do in our office where you bond two buttons and just put some elastic chain or energy chain to quickly squeeze a diastema. Uh, if I have to do this, I um, like to use what I call a double bonded retainer, which is two strands of OrthoFlex Tech. Um, now, if you look at my uh, photo on the left, I'm covering the patient's eyes, uh, a little cool little pearl within a pearl. Um, if you want to um, use uh, uh, goggles for your patients, and those goggles tend to lift up when the patient puts their head down on your orthodontic chair, you could simply trim uh, the um, the the length of the goggle so it just covers just behind the ear so now when the patient lies back the goggles cover their eyes properly and they don't push forward so I'm, all i'm doing is taking scissors and just shortening the goggles so they don't uh lift up when the patient puts their head back on the headrest if we go back uh to the first elastic one yes 
uh, not this one, but the, the one before it, uh, what size elastic would you recommend? Well, so I, I think you need to use a five ounce elastic. So I'm using three sixteenth five ounce, um, but a separator works really, really, really well. I'll tell you, you put a separator of the tooth, the tooth might just pop out right then and there. The separator is also nice because it's colored and it's radio opaque. Um, I use separators for anterior teeth. Um, so if I have to wiggle out a baby canine, for example, on a nervous child or, or a baby incisor, a separator is perfect. Um, and for a molar, I'll just use an elastic band. What they're doing in this technique is they're taking a Sharpie marker and actually just giving some color to it. Um, but, but the truth be told, you'll put this, the moment you put the elastic band in the tooth, the next day this tooth is gonna fall out. And um, uh, so I would say 3 16th, five ounce, but really anything is gonna work well. It's gonna constrict at the cervical margin um, and it's just going to um, really erode the, the, those really uh, collagenous tissues and, and the tooth will just fall right on out. So three sixteenth five ounce. But anything would work, right? Anything would work great. So here we are using a double bonded retainer. Now in my office, I'll talk about what I like to do is I actually like to use bond braid in my upper arch, but when I use this double bonded retainer, this splinted retainer, and I'll do this really for thick biotypes where I'm worried about holding a diastema, I think you actually need to use orthoflex tech uh, rather than two strands of bond braid. And I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. This was a pearl that I mentioned yesterday during my presentation. Um, we have about 15 minutes to go, 14 minutes to go. So we'll finish right on time um, where uh, they're using a crimpable post to reduce the pressure from the push rod. So the biggest problem with the forces is that the push rod is overactivated, right? Okay, people make that mistake, they overactivate it, and it puts too much pressure on the bracket, the canine bracket. So the bracket breaks, the tooth rotates mesial inward, and now you have to take the appliance out and build up your wire sizes again. So this nice little technique is using a crimpable post between the canine and premolar bracket, and the push rod pushes against the post and not directly against the bracket. Now, you can also use a K-module. Again, Brian Anderson also talks a lot about using the K-module, um, but here is a, the case that I presented yesterday where I'm using a crippable post, a surgical post um, in the uh, lower arch. So the push rod pushes against the post and doesn't put any pressure on the bracket. So if you like to use forces, um, I encourage you to use crippable posts as a stop. A gear and lock would also work very well, um, I assume. Anything that prevents you from putting pressure on the canine. But ultimately, uh, the biggest mistake with all forces appliances is overactivation. Uh, and I think if we just went slower and started them earlier, uh, they would be a little bit more effective. Uh, a great pearl uh, by Jeremy Smith. I think when he posted this pearl on the Orthodontic Pearls group, I think like 500 likes happened. Uh, people just lost their mind. And, and it, it really is a wonderful pearl that addresses uh, malrotated second premolars. Uh, and what we're doing in this pearl is a bonding an occlusal tube, uh, a molar tube on the occlusal. Okay, we're bonding a molar tube on the occlusal, and this is gonna do simultaneous extrusion and rotation. So here we have a really rotated um, uh, maxillary second premolar and infra occlusion. He's bonding a molar tube on the occlusal and threading a light night tie through it, and that tooth quickly will extrude and rotate into position. Um, the key for this is properly threading through that occlusal tube. You can also use an eyelet if you don't want to use a tube, because uh, you want to make sure you're rotating that tooth properly. And a lot of times people would be resistant to um, rotating a premolar correctly. A lot of times these premolars will be um, three quarters rotated in the opposite direction. But with this technique, you can really get rapid rotational correction. Uh, I've never seen any type of loss of vitality on that tooth. And this really is an alternative to an open coil spring and segmental power chains with buttons. It works great. Now, I will tell you, um, you know, uh, Dr. Melson, Berta Melson, one of the great uh, orthodontists of the world, um, talked a lot about how uh, yesterday, uh, or last week, she talked a lot about how with these pearls, the biomechanics are not perfect. And, and that's, that's probably true. A lot of times these pearls are shortcuts by definition, and the biomechanical control may not be as ideal. I think nothing would be better than placing open coil spring and segmental power chain. Um, and that is one of the downsides 
of a pearl. In many ways, uh, we are uh, compromising um, the biomechanical control. And in this particular pearl, the downside is that the tooth will uh, extrude and tip. Uh, and I'll show you that in a second. So here's Dr. Smith's wonderful pearl on premolar uh, derotation from my office. Um, I'm bonding a tube and we are going to extrude and rotate that upper right five. But here's that mistake that I was talking about. Here I'm using an eyelet instead of a pearl. Um, and I got great rotational control within three months. Within three months, that tooth is already accessible. But look at that nice tipping and extrusion that I now have to account for. So uh, sometimes you rob Peter to pay Paul. But, um, but I will tell you, this is a wonderful pearl to use. And I, I, a week doesn't go by where I don't use Dr. Smith's uh, wonderful pearl for extrusion and rotation of your premolar. And along the line of this pearl is uh, from Dr. Masters. Uh, uh, Lawrence Masters is not only just a great clinician, his photography is like out of this world. Every time he posts a case, I, I just, I can't get over the quality of his photography. Uh, and it's such an easy um, acceptance uh, for the journal because uh, the photography really just, just, just speaks volumes and it really um, shows you the quality of his clinical technique as well. So here we have a rotated premolar and perhaps you have run out of eyelets and eyelet will work really well here or you don't have room to put on an eyelet. Sometimes you don't even have room to access that eyelet. Here he is using a crimpable stopper from his arch wire. He just slid it right off the arch wire and he bonded a crimpable stopper and he put a little flowable over top of it and he's simply using it like a self-ligating bracket, a mini self-ligating bracket and then he switches it eventually to, to a regular bracket. So genius technique from Dr. Masters, who is not only a wonderful um, um, orthodontist, but also just wonderful at his case documentation. Is there a question? Yeah, uh, for the previous, the premolar rotation. Yes. Uh, so another, another person who, uh, when using it, they found severe mobility when they tried it. Uh, so they're asking, what size wire are you using? And are you bypassing adjacent teeth? So this, so you can see here that we're not bypassing adjacent teeth. I'm using an 012 or an 014. I wouldn't use anything heavier than that. Um, and I, I think the mobility is probably normal. I, I think it, it's probably normal and natural. And I, I don't think it's pathological mobility by any means. Um, and, you know, within one visit, that tooth totally corrected. And I could easily bond the labial surface of that tooth if I wanted to. Um, what I want you to notice from Jeremy's Pearl uh, uh, um, is look at that he used um, an occlusal rest on his upper six. Does everybody see that upper left six, how he put some composite material on that upper left six uh, supporting cusp? So that is to prevent um, not only uh, occlusion on the, on the tube on the upper left five, but also on the extruded tooth uh, after it's been corrected. So um, I think it's important to make sure that patient is not biting heavily on that bracket, on the, on the tooth. Another question, uh, same topic. Will a piggyback technique for the premolar rotation prevent the adjacent teeth from rotating? Oh yeah, of course. So uh, you can never go wrong with piggyback mechanics. I'm, I, 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 I think piggyback mechanics are just fantastic. And I actually even like double night tie piggyback mechanics, maybe like, like an 18 base, with like a, an 012 um, a piggyback. That's a great idea. Um, and I think uh, you know, you know, the, challenge with, the challenge with this is not what's gonna happen to the four. The four is gonna be fine. You can even steal ligature of the three and the four together. The challenge is gonna be the five is gonna extrude and tip a little bit. But I will tell you guys, uh, you know, I, again, there's nothing wrong with having precise biomechanical control, but this pearl was one of those things that, that just works so well, even if it is a little bit you know, I guess academically speaking, a little bit sloppy. Uh, it works so well, and you will be amazed within one visit how how fast it corrects. It, it is one of those great pearls that just just blew my mind when I saw it, and I I, I use this all the time with great success. Um, make sure you put a cinch in that arch wire, particularly. Uh, and there's nothing wrong using a piggyback, but I I don't think you really need. We use piggyback mechanics when we're bringing in a canine. Because when you try to extrude a canine, you put too much pressure on the lateral incisor and it causes intrusion, which causes root resorption. You also get distal bone loss. In this technique, you're not gonna get any of that stuff on the premolar, the, 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 on, on the first premolar. So you can use the piggyback, but I'm not sure it's needed. Okay. 
a great article uh, by Dr. Bill Crutchfield uh, and with con contributions from Sharif Al Hadi uh, and my good friend Sean Miller. Uh, Bill Crutchfield and Sharif Al Hadi uh, practice near me in Virginia. And this is what constitutes miracle mouthwash, uh, magic mouthwash. Uh, magic mouthwash uh, has a number of different uh, types um, and really any type of concoction um, that has an antihistamine or um, an antifungal, um, you know, um, an, an acid uh, can constitute a magic mouthwash. But what we're using in an orthodontic office when we need to prescribe a magic mouthwash is Benadryl, Maalox, and Lidocaine. Okay, you could add some Nystatin, but a lot of times our patients are not immunocompromised, particularly if you thought you had maybe some thrush in the mouth, you could probably add some nice data, but most often it's Benadryl, Maalox, and Xylocaine. And what you want to get from Magic Mouthwash, it's an equal part mixture. So the same amount of Benadryl, the same amount of Maalox, and the same amount of liquid lidocaine. And the patient does not swallow this, they simply rinse and spit. And this is really good for a patient who is getting a lot of recurrent aphthous ulcerations. Okay. You can simply do this non-prescription based if you just took one part Benadryl, one part Maalox over the counter and just do it without the numbing agent. That would work really well. Paradex also works very well. Also salt water rinses also work very well. So here we are using Benadryl, which is an antihistamine. Benadryl works by reducing the inflammation. Maalox works because it, it changes the pH, right? So if we can get a more base pH, uh, it's an antacid, but Maalox also works by coating the mouth. So it, it changes the pH, which, which helps uh, heal those aphthous ulcerations, but it also coats the mouth uh, and the liquid lidocaine gives you that, that slight numbing. But uh, don't be afraid just to use one part Benadryl, one part Maalox, that works very well as well. Um, you're gonna rinse for 30 seconds and spit out. Um, and you can, any compounding pharmacy will make this. If you have trouble memorizing Benadryl, Maalox, and liquid lidocaine, remember the acronym BMX. Uh, so so uh, Benadryl, uh, Maalox, and uh, Xylocaine or lidocaine. Uh, if you can remember the portmanteau of Xyloxadryl, that also works as well. But BMX, a nice acronym, Benadryl, Maalox, and liquid lidocaine or liquid xylocaine works very, very well. Equal part mixture. Can't beat that. Easy to remember. Uh, a great article from my good friend Jeff Shirk. Jeff's in um, Ohio, in Cincinnati, Ohio, about how to measure a bonded retainer. Now, a lot of staff will do eye point measure, uh, eyeball measuring their bonded retainers. But what we're doing here is we are measuring it on the labial surface to be used on the lingual. And what we're doing is measuring it from the midpoint of one tooth to the mesial embrasure of the other tooth. And that equals from midpoint to midpoint on the lingual. So if we use the labial surface, we can precisely measure it on the lingual by measuring it from the midpoint of one tooth to the mesial embrasure. And by ending at the mesial embrasure, we're basically accounting for tooth thickness here. So the midpoint of the canine to the mesial embrasure between the lateral and canine equals midpoint to midpoint on the lingual. This way your staff member doesn't have to measure it a little too long or a little too short and can measure it precisely every time. So measure on the labial so you don't interfere with that etch and do it from the midpoint of one tooth to the mesial embrasure on the other. Great pearl from Dr. Jeff Shirk. Most people know my retention protocol. I've talked about this before. I like bond braid in the upper arch with orthoflex tech in the lower arch. I don't like orthoflex tech in the upper arch because it will stretch and you will get recurring diastemas. Bond braid is not perfect, it doesn't stretch, but you do get fraying over time. If you have a patient who is fraying their bond braid, you may need to change to retainium. So upper retainium, lower orthoflex tech works really, really, really well. I always like overlay appliances, uh, overlay Essex or overlay Hollies. Remember, bonded retainers are just temporary solutions. And here you can see my Holly. I like the Holly to cover the bonded retainer and protect it. It also helps control the overbites. A great pearl from Dr. Berta Melson. If you are placing um, um, a, or if you have a patient with a, a dentalist space, uh, or maybe you are reopening that space, that bone quickly loses uh, um, density on the buckle plate. And what she is doing is she is placing a mini screw, not to support a pontic, Dr. Graham's technique from, from about a decade ago, but not to support a pontic, rather just to support the bone. So she's putting a mini screw below a pontic. Uh, just to maintain bone density. So here we have a patient with a Maryland bridge with a mini screw below it just to maintain bone density. A brilliant pearl by Dr. Melson. 
uh, um, Dr. Carl Antini. Uh, just a great idea to use a mini screw for bone support. Uh, and many of you know that I've written many articles on what I call a Maryland bridge-like retainer where we use a Maryland bridge uh, and an acrylic tooth to support space. Uh, but in this technique, we would simply use the mini screw right above the pontic to support that bone. And this was a great pearl that we'll end with that I wrote, uh, that, that I talked about using a pontic. Hi everybody, Neil Kravitz here. Today I'm gonna to show you how to make a very quick laboratory pontic using your stone model. It's really an outdated technique with 3D printers, but if you don't have your 3D printer, this is a nice quick technique that we use to make a pontic in our office. You can certainly build it up with flowable. That's what I used to do. But now I will take an old Invisalign tray. This is someone's Invisalign uh, from their box that they did not pick up. This has been in our office for a number of months now. And I will try to size up the pontic as close as possible. So I'm simply going to cut the aligner. And I will use that pontic as a template to fit on the tray. So we're just going to fill it up with flowable, believe it or not, bracket adhesive paste works really well. So if you just use your transbond, uh, that would work really, really well. I'll put it here. And then you will actually have a really nice, quick, easy pontic that works really well and has a high level of aesthetics. Thank you so much. So this is this, uh, that pearl uh, in photographs, I am taking an old Invisalign template, an Invisalign tray from a different patient. And I'm, I'm sizing up uh, the teeth and trying to uh, create a quick pontic in the mouth. Now you can, can do this a number of different ways, uh, but this is using um, uh, unused Invisalign trays uh, and using the, the trays as a well to create pontic teeth. Uh, this is wonderful if you're making in-office flippers or if you just want to make a tooth for the mouth. It works very well. And you get a real high quality aesthetic tooth. Look at image C. How, look at the, the aesthetics of that tooth without any carving in it. And this is a great thing your staff can do and you can delegate this. So here we are just filling someone else's Invisalign tray uh, and making a pontic tooth for that. Okay. And this is a variation of a pearl that I, I shared before and uh, of how to make a pontic using flowable um, uh, on a... Um, mixing pad. Now we're just doing it um, using an Invisalign tray. And this uh, video on how to make a Pontic is actually on the JCO Facebook page. If you're not on the JCO, JCO Facebook page, please join us on that Facebook page. I try to post uh, weekly on that page. Please join us. And ultimately, uh, the greatest gift would be to subscribe to the JCO. I hope uh, you all will. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kravitz, for the time. Uh, I said this at the beginning, but I think a lot of people weren't here. Uh, for subscribing to JCO, uh, you can use our show special. It's uh, AAO21, so AAO21, uh, on our website. That'll get you, you don't have to do anything with the booths in order to get this. Uh, just go to our website, use that show special. It'll get you two free issues for every year subscription. So get one year, you get 14 issues instead of 12. You do two years, you get 28 issues instead of 24. It's a pretty good deal. Uh, and uh, you can just do that right on our website. Um, and I did want to show really quickly, if I know people have, have got places to be, um, on our website, a couple of little <laughs> pearls of our own here. Uh, so this is the June issue, which you can also get from our booth. It's free on our website at the moment. You can download the whole thing at our booth. I'll just click into the Master Clinician article here. A uh, couple things I want to point out. If you're interested, our whole archive is online. Sometimes it can be daunting to search. Every article in the, that's newer, we're going back and doing all the older ones too, you'll have similar articles here. So you can kind of even go through a tree of articles uh, to, to keep going backwards. Uh, PDF up here, if you need that. Comments, the comments section. If you want to comment an article, you just need to have an account on our website. Don't need to be a subscriber. Uh, and you can comment down there. That will show up. 
Uh, and then I'm not seeing it here for some reason, so that's not good, but uh, let me look at a different issue because I did just see it earlier. Oh, it's because I'm not logged in. I, of course, logged in to demonstrate this, and then it logged me out because it took too long. Um, so let me log in real fast to show you favorites. So you like an article a lot, you want to come back to it later, mark it as a favorite. It'll be stored in your account, easy to find uh, at a later date. You don't have to go piling through the whole website in order to find it later to be right here. Uh, so Neil already mentioned the webinars. If you are a subscriber, you get access to all our webinars. Uh, I also want to mention this is a digital portal from him. Uh, so we do have some online only content. If you are a print subscriber, make sure you have your online account set up so that you can see some of the online only content. This is a digital pearl from Dr. Kravitz from last year. So thanks everyone for joining us and I hope you have a good uh, rest of the AAO. Thanks guys. See ya.